Okay. Yeah, we have a, a warm welcome to Mel Scott. We'll uh, very happy that you were here with us, and I would like to I ask you to start your presentation now. Mel, it's your turn. Uh, okay, have you? I can't see my presentation. Have you put it up? And you need yes, to run through these slides uh, first. <laughs> the first few slides are yours, okay? Ah, there it is. Sorry, <laughs> I was seeing something different. Okay, so the talk that I'm going to be giving you today um, is a, an exploration of the gifts a midwife brings to a lost birth. The aims that I want to cover in today's session, I'd like you to experience, um, to witness a parent's experience of stillbirth. Um, I'm going to show you some photographs and possibly some video footage about our loss of our son, which happened in August the 2nd, 2009. Um, so four years ago now, I'm hoping that you'll get a better understanding of the role of the midwife um, in my experience of, of my son's stillbirth. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to reflect upon the, the six C's, which is a nursing and midwifery based theoretical concept. Um, and, and hopefully I'll be able to give you some information about how I see the six C's within my story. Um, and I'm hoping that by the end of the session, you'll go away feeling quite empowered about the gifts that a midwife can bring to a lost birth. So I'm going to talk first of all about what the six C's are, how they came about, um, and then I'm going to talk through my story with you. Um, and then I'll go through each of the six C's in turn, explaining why I feel that they're relevant to my story and which particular gifts the midwives brought in relation to those six days. And then at the end of the session, I'll invite any questions. Um, so you can be typing those in and Christian will pick those up to let me know about those at the end. So the, the six C's are a theoretical framework which was developed to support change within the NHS. It's been used within nursing and midwifery, but it's also been picked up by other areas of the NHS. I came across it in my role as an occupational therapist, but I've, I've found it a really useful way of reflecting upon people's care to see how effective it's been and whether there's any additions that could be made or any changes that can be made to improve the care. So the, the six C's are com care, compassion, competence, communication, courage and commitment um, and as you listen to my story I want you to reflect on each of the six C's in turn um, and just have a think about what examples you can find for those six C's within my story and I'll, I'll try and pull them out for you. We've, um, we've changed it slightly from my usual format, usually I play a video if you want to watch the full video after my talk, um, you can find it at this link. Um, and I think that's going to be made available on, on the website later as well. Um, the video is, is slightly more of an emotional impact, um, I think, in, in that it plays through with actual video footage of our time with Finlay. Um, and also um, it plays to music. So it's a little bit more emotional than me telling you my story, but I hope that the question time at the end might give you a bit more of an opportunity to explore anything that I um, don't cover in enough detail for you. So I'm going to click through some photographs. I, I first want to explain to you that these are photographs that were taken after Finley died. Um, there are photographs taken from just after he died and also before we buried him. Um, so I, I want you to see what we saw as parents so that you get a better understanding of what parents are going through. But I hope that you won't be too shocked by those and I hope that they'll be um, a useful learning tool for you. If anyone gets upset or affected by um, the photographs that I show you, 
then I'm I am available online. I can make my email address available to you um, if you want to talk about anything afterwards. Um, so I decided to become um, a mum much earlier than than this story. It kind of starts before we met Finley, really. Um, it took us a long time to decide to become parents, um, and when we did, we we got pregnant in 2008, just around about Mother's Day, um, and we actually experienced a miscarriage. So we went through quite a roller coaster before we knew it was going to be a miscarriage. I was told that I had the wrong dates for my pregnancy, um, and then we had to have lots of tests done on the hormones to see whether they were going up as they should be, and they weren't. So we actually lost our first baby. Um, so our story with Finley starts much earlier than some people find out. Um, so we we actually had a scan at eight weeks. Um, that's Finley at eight weeks old. Um, the reason I asked for this was I wasn't having any problems at all, but I was really struggling with the anxiety of finding out that I was pregnant um, and with the anxiety of not knowing whether the baby would be okay because we didn't actually get to the point of um, the baby growing or having a heartbeat with the last pregnancy. Um, so we found out he was fine and we went on very, very nervous at the time. We didn't really tell anyone that we were pregnant um, until we passed the 12 week scan. That's Finley at his 12 week scan. Um, went through quite an emotional time when we had the 12 week scan. We both burst into tears when we found out about him um, and that he was okay and he was perfectly replicating his dad's usual position of lying on his back with his feet in the air, one hand behind his head. So we were quite um, entertained by this at the start. This is Finley's 20 week scan. By this point, I'd completely um, forgotten all of my earlier anxiety and was totally immersed uh, in being pregnant in my journey towards motherhood. Um, I was really, really enjoying pregnancy. I was probably the healthiest I'd ever been. I was having regular reflexology, regular Reiki sessions, um, was was totally immersed in preparing for a gentle, natural birth. Um, we were debating a home birth, but we decided on a water birth in a birthing center. This was um, our last pregnancy shot at a friend's wedding, um, and I, I had absolutely no idea of what, what was going to happen. Um, so at 41 weeks of pregnancy, 41 plus 5, my waters broke and I phoned the hospital wondering what to do um, and they advised us to come in and be be examined and, and checked to make sure that everything was okay. Um, so when we got to the hospital um, there was meconium in my waters when they broke um, so they told me that the water birth was out of the question um, and that I needed to be admitted to the hospital. But because I wasn't in labour, my husband was actually sent home. Um, so I was on my own in the antenatal ward because I wasn't in labour um, and I was asking for uh, more frequent checks as the meconium was getting thicker and darker. So they put me on the heart monitor um, and about 10 minutes after being on the monitor, I was calling the midwife back to say that his heartbeat was dropping um, and getting more worried by this point. Um, and to cut two hours into a couple of minutes, um, what, what actually happened was he, he got into quite significant distress. A doctor was called. Um, when the doctor arrived, his heartbeat stopped um, on the monitor as they were watching it. So they rushed me in to do an ultrasound um, and eventually did do a, an emergency caesarean. Um, but sadly, Finley was born um, and he, he didn't wake up. Um, so this is Finley just after he was born. I was rushed in for a, a general anaesthetic, so I'm, a, I'm asleep at this point, still in recovery. My husband was called to um, the hospital. To, when he arrived, he found out that I'd had surgery. Um, and that Finley was was born by cesarean, but that he he just didn't wake up. Um, my parents came, so he's in the arms of his grandmother there. And it, we went through quite a process. We ended up spending three days in hospital, which I know is is quite unusual. And Finley didn't um, leave us in that time at all. Where his grandparents came to see him. That's Baz's mum and her boyfriend. Um, 
he had to do all of the phone calls. The midwives looked after him really well, supported him to phone them. Um, the midwife that was on duty helped Baz to bath and dress Finley. Um, and there's a really lovely moment that was captured on video where they, Finn, Baz discovers that Finley's ears are, are the same as Baz, so he's got one ear bigger than the other. Um, when my mum asked me if I wanted to hold Finley, I'd, I'd just woken up um, and I, I didn't want to. So the look on my face is just me feeling completely numb and, and not knowing how to process what's happened at all. Luckily, our friends came and somebody thought to take a family photograph. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud that we've got this photograph. It's the only photograph that we've got of the two of us together with Finley. And it's a, it captures a really important moment, although I'm, I'm sure you can see the, the pain is quite clear to see in our faces. As time went on, I started wanting to get to know Finley. So I, I am a, have a keen interest in photography. So a lot of the photographs you see are ones that I took with our camera. Um, as time went on on the first day, I started to want to hold Finley and to stroke him. It became much more natural to want to get to know my son. And um, by the end of the first night, I wouldn't put him down. I slept with him in my arms. Every time I got out of bed, I phoned the midwives and rang the bell to get them to come and hold him. And um, when I went to the toilet, they would hold on to him for me and they accepted everything that I needed to do. So over the course of those few days, he had his footprints taken. Um, we got to give him presents. My husband dressed him in a football outfit. Um, and, and we gradually got to know our son. There was a pull out bed. So my husband was able to come and spend some time with us. Um, and as time went on, the skills of the midwife became really, really important. So all of the midwives made different suggestions to us. Um, but the one that made the most difference really was our bereavement midwife. She happened to be on duty two out of the three days um, that we, we were in hospital. Um, and on the last night, she, she decided that she needed to help me prepare for, for going home. So she came and took a series of photographs of, of which this is one. Um, and she asked me what I wanted my last memory to be. She suggested that I gave my son a kiss. Um, it hadn't actually occurred to me that I was allowed to do this. Um, it feels like all of your choices are taken away when this happens to you. Um, and it just never occurred to me that it was the most natural thing in the world to give my son a kiss. I, I had all sorts of thoughts going through my head. Um, so I'm really, really grateful to her for that opportunity. She asked me what I wanted my last memory to be and I, I broke down in tears because I hadn't changed his nappy and I hadn't got the chance to bath or dress him at all. Um, and she actually supported us to make those choices. So she helped us communicate with the midwives that were on duty the next day. And I was able to bath him. I was able to dress him. Um, I read him a story and all of that was captured on video for us. Um, our community midwife played a big part as well. So two weeks later, we chose to bury Finley um, and I wanted to see him again, but I was so scared to do so. And with great compassion and skill, really, she, she supported us and, and problem solved with us. So suggested that the um, communal directors took a photograph so that we could see whether we wanted to see him again. And we did choose to bring him home. So that's him in the coffin in the cot at home the night before we said goodbye. So moving on to how the six C's helped us, just as a reflection really, we had fantastic care. Um, it was a really difficult situation and everybody cared for us and our baby as if he was alive, everybody handled him with great care. They made sure to wrap him up and, and keep him warm. They wrapped him up in a really fluffy, soft blanket, which made it very natural for us to want to hold him. They explained to our family and friends that came to visit that we had Finley with us, and they talked to them about how to talk about Finley, to use his name, to talk about him in the present tense, and to 
be led by us really so if we wanted them to hold him that they were around if they were upset by doing so we had completely individualized non-judgmental care um, which gave us a lot more choice I said before that I think your choices are taken away in that situation everything that you plan for the birth plan that you create everything that you imagine changes just in an instant um, and you need somebody to walk with you and work out what it is that you want and to support you in that so there were things that we chose to do that probably weren't the norm it probably isn't the norm for a, a mum to want to bath her dead baby after three days it probably isn't the norm um, for that mother to wipe his nose as it bleeds when they move it probably isn't the norm for people to take photographs and it certainly isn't accepted by the wider society we face a lot of judgment in the choices that we made and people don't really understand why we did those things but the midwives that were on du on duty all of them supported the choices that we made they made suggestions and helped us to manage those things and I think it's worth pointing out that the care that we were given also included care of Baz, my husband. Um, so he was supported to phone our families. He was offered time outside. There was a space that he could go and sit and talk to people if he needed it. Um, he was supported to make his own memories. So they, they helped him to dress Finley when he was quite frightened about doing that and they helped him to take photographs of Finley in an England shirt um, which was really really important to Baz it was one of the only things that Baz had bought while I was pregnant and he really wanted him to wear it um, um, our family when they came in all of our family and friends were looked after they were given food and drink they had a space where they could go and talk to people if they wanted to um, and when the midwives came for the funeral later on um, they made sure to go over and talk to our grandparents and check that they were being um, looked after and supported as well and I think that's really really important factor compassion I think the compassion just showed through the whole time that we were in hospital and it's continued to be shown our community midwife was absolutely fantastic when we went home um, she also looked after us in our next pregnancy so we've got a daughter now who's three and a half she showed true compassion throughout both pregnancies absolutely understanding every need that we had I think one of the key things is that none of these six C's cost anything actually all we're looking for is is someone to understand and someone to give their time and, and do that in a gentle supportive way i think the video of baz bathing finley particularly shows the compassion of the midwife that that was on duty at that time she chatters to baz she shows him how to bath a baby how to hold a baby um, she completely normalizes the experience um, and made it feel to Baz like it was the most normal thing in the world to do. There, there was a huge understanding that we needed our support around us. So we're, we're people that have a lot of friends, we have a lot of family and we're very close to those people. Um, and we had visitors day and night for three days which I'm sure for a labour ward is, is not the norm um, and there was massive understanding shown to us they came and chatted to us to make sure that we were getting enough rest and when we explained that we needed those people to be there they were completely understanding about that and I think throughout there was huge compassion shown around the choices that we were making so nobody judged us for the things that we wanted to do nobody um, showed that they were feeling that it was not the norm to spend so much time with your baby and when decisions had to be made so things like the post-mortem or when to go home how to go home um, they were very very compassionate and they knew exactly what things we would find difficult so they were keen to reassure us about how Finley would be looked after 
um, they were keen to reassure us that during the post-mortem that he would be returned to as whole as possible, which was really important to me. Um, and they were very compassionate when they described some of the changes that his body would go through and talking us through how that might influence the decisions that we made. Competence is a, a really interesting one to think about when it comes to our story because there were some things that could have happened differently when we were in labour um, that, that might have changed the outcome. But the competence that we were shown after Finley's birth, the competence that the midwives displayed, is, is second to none, really. The bereavement midwife was hugely skilled. There were two key things that she did. Um, she made us realise that we didn't have a second chance. So we only had that moment to make a lifetime of memories. We were only ever going to get those few days with him. Um, and some families don't get that amount of time. Some families just have a, a matter of hours to make their memories. And they really understood why we needed those memories and why it would be important to us in the future. I think the skills of the midwife um, asking me what I wanted my last memory to be, I'm, I'm sure that's not a question that every midwife asks families, nor would I advocate it to be. But for me in that moment, it was the one way of helping me release my innermost wishes to be a mum and to do normal mum things. So to do the things like bathing him, changing his nappy, counting his toes because he'd been dressed for the whole of three days. I hadn't seen his feet. I hadn't seen what his tummy looked like. Um, and to actually give somebody that chance to be a mum so that I have no regrets about the things that I wanted to do is really powerful and takes a huge amount of skill. Communication is important with every every labour, every birth, every family that you work with. But it's even more important with families that lose a baby because their memories are heightened, their emotions are heightened, the hormones, the, the effect of the things that they're going through actually makes their memory much clearer. So the communication by midwives needs to be very, very um, clear, gentle, compassionate, but also respectful. Um, and all of the midwives that looked after us were clearly communicating well with our families. They were communicating well with each of us. Myself and my husband have very different educational levels. We have very different background circumstances. So to be able to communicate both with both of us on, on, on our level was really, really important. There's key decisions that need to be made so things like what to do for the funeral what whether you want to have a cremation or a burial whether you want to have a post-mortem those topics are very very difficult ones to raise but very very important because they're a choice which is empowering but they're also something that's going to stay with that family forever if they if they make the wrong decision or they regret something the communication is, is vital. And one of the biggest things I know from working in the NHS that sometimes communication between different teams and different shifts is a, is a critical point of care. Um, and actually what the bereavement midwife did on that last night was communicate. She wrote down all of the things that I wanted to do. So bath and thinly dressing him, um, changing his nappy, undressing him and then changing his nappy and dressing him in his pyjamas, reading him a bedtime story and choosing how to leave our son in the hospital. So whether we wanted to take him to the morgue ourselves, whether we wanted to leave him on his own in the room, whether we wanted to, him to come to the doors of the hospital with us, all of those things were really, really important to us. And she wrote down everything and gave it to the staff that were going to be on duty the next day. She came and let me know which particular staff member would be helping us through that. And it, and it went exactly as planned. So the communication was, was fantastic and, and very skilled, um, very, very important to us.
courage is a massive one. I think all parents that lose a baby display huge courage. Um, I think it's widely recognised. People say to parents that have lost a baby all the time, I don't know how you're being so strong. Um, you're so brave. Mostly it's about survival for them. I never recognised that I was being strong at all. What I recognised was the courage in the staff that dealt with us. Um, there were key points where those midwives did display a lot of courage. They accepted our choices um, without any judgment. And I'm sure that some of the choices, some of the things that we made, that we wanted to do, some of the decisions that we made aren't the norm. And when something is against what usually happens, it can be really frightening for people, especially if it's something that they haven't dealt with before. Um, I don't know in that hospital, I don't know whether the staff that were on duty had looked after parents that had lost a baby before. I don't know whether they'd had any training, um, but they all displayed a great deal of understanding for us and they were they were very courageous in the care that they gave us. I know after the event now, I know that the midwife that looked after us in labour spoke up um, when she returned to work. I know that she's made changes about our situation and about the care. So there are things that have changed as a direct result of the experiences that we had. Um, things like bringing in, bringing in extra staff when the labour ward is busy so that I wouldn't have had to have been looked after on the, on the antenatal ward. I could have been looked after on the labour ward. Um, things like using the CTG stickers to monitor the traces of the babies. Um, they weren't using those routinely. They now are using those. And I know that um, when it came to the decision for the emergency caesarean, I know that she spoke up uh, against the doctor's decision um, to do an ultrasound and an internal to get the emergency caesarean happening as quickly as possible. And I think that that takes a massive amount of courage. I hope that there's something to be learned from every single stillbirth, um, but I think it takes a lot of bravery to examine those lessons. Um, and I hope that the people that are coming into the profession, the people that are working in it now, feel more supported as, as time goes on, as supervision is, is improved, um, to, to make those changes and to speak out. I think it takes a huge amount of courage and strength to walk with families at this time. Um, I, it's very, very hard when a baby dies. You can't change that. You can't take it back. You can't give the parents what they want. But what you can do is walk every step with them while they're in your care. And what you can do is make sure that you are able to support their wishes um, and to make a bad situation as gentle as it can be. Commitment. Um, it's an interesting one when I was thinking about commitment and how that was displayed as part of my story. I think there was a huge commitment on all of the staff that were looking after us to support our decisions no matter what. So at times where we couldn't decide, we, we asked them for extra time to decide about the post-mortem. I'm sure that again, the norm is for post-mortems to be done very quickly. Actually, it was four days before we released Finlay to have the post-mortem. Um, our decision for extra time, our decision to consider it and talk to all of our families, that was respected. That was really, really important to us. Our decision not to have the hospital service, but to use our own funeral directors was respected and supported. Our decision to take Finlay home the night before the funeral was understood um, and supported by everybody that looked after us. I think that there was a commitment to on on behalf of the hospital and and the staff that were involved to learn the lessons and to change things for, things for other people so every single staff member that was present at that cesarean came and saw me over the next 3 days 
most of them cried with me most of them all of them apologized for what had happened um and every single one of them said that they hope it never happens again they i know that they'll carry finley's story with them and i know a huge amount of people do that and i hope that change is happening because of that i certainly have a commitment to promoting change and i think there was massive commitment on all of the staff to provide individual care for us for each person so for my husband for the grandparents and for Finley they they looked after Finley and made sure that he was okay so they kept coming and checking his condition um, and they cared for him as, as if he was a baby in their care a live baby in their care that's the end of my reflection um and and my decision my um, understanding of the six c's so i've left a little bit of time for you for any questions that you may have um i think i can't see my chat window but i hope christian's there to monitor it thank you very much mel we're waiting for the questions okay it's amazing how, how do christian how uh, do i get back so i can see the main chat window uh you are in the chat window yeah i can only see you and me i can't oh everyone i click on everyone ah got it thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay oh i'm reading everyone's yeah. comments now thank you <laughs> um we had a question before from Sophie. She had her hand up. Uh, Sophie, do you want to ask a question? So. Linda, I do share it with student midwives. We do regular training, full training days for them. Does anyone have any questions? What would you say some would be some things that a midwife should not say? I always get asked yes. this on my study days. Um, I th I think that there there isn't any set thing that you shouldn't say because it will be different to every person but I guess a general rule of thumb is not to tell them at the time of their loss that they can have another baby because they don't want another baby right there and then in that moment they want the baby that they've just lost um, I think avoiding topics like religion or saying things like it happened for the best the baby's in a better place now i think all of those things can add extra upset to the situation um, and i think if you don't have um if you can't find the words to express yourself then you can say i'm sorry i don't have any words i just want to say i'm sorry um just being there with the parents is enough Are there any points you have for parents, support staff uh, from a doula? We have lots of doulas come on our training days. I have a huge passion for um, doulas and the care that they can give. I think my tips would be um, perhaps carrying a just-in-case bag. So I know doulas have bag of kit for each birth that they go to. I think what I would advise is carrying a just-in-case bag in case you're dealing with a stillbirth suddenly, so things to help parents make memories. Um, this is our memory box that the charity I run supplies. It's got things in it like teddies, things to take footprints, 
things to bathe the baby. It's got a jewelry set that um, is a family jewelry set. So a key ring for dad, bracelet for mum, two bracelets for baby. It doesn't cost very much. There are lots of charities that will supply these things. But the difference it makes for parents to have those memories afterwards is really, really important. I'd also say this is good advice for hospitals as well to have boxes like these or things available to make the memory making process much easier. Um, can't see any other questions on there. Lots of nice comments. <laughs> It was a it was a litigation case. I'm I'm now able to talk about the litigation side of things. Um, we we went through a solicitor um, and we had lots of reports back. Eventually, um, we found out that there were lots of breaches of duty of care, but that none of the breaches of duty of care would have changed the outcome, or they couldn't they could be a hundred percent or that Finley would have wouldn't have died anyway had everything been done as it should be. I think I left the hospital feeling like everything that could have been done was done because of the aftercare that we received. It was much later when I started realising that some of the care in labour might have been different in different hospitals. Um, it, it made a massive difference and I don't, I still don't want to complain about that care. I'm going to meet with the hospital next week to share our findings with them so that they can carry on making the changes that they've made. I wish there was another way for parents to get their stories heard and their lessons learnt without having to go through litigation because it's an awful process and you have to hear read things and hear things that you really don't want to relive so my question my um decision not to have an induction was actually called into question and and i read in black and white that had i chosen to have an induction when i was advised to at 41 weeks finley would have been alive now so that was a really hard thing to witness as a parent and i think it does make staff defensive but I hope that staff are willing to learn the lessons. Genuine mistakes do get made. You're only human. It, what makes the difference is your ability to hold your hands up and go, OK, I, I learn from this. What, what have I learned from this? The decision to have a post-mortem was one of the hardest decisions to make, Rona. Um, I, um, medically trained, I've been to autopsies, I've been in a dissecting room, I've seen dead bodies and the thought of somebody doing that to my son was was the worst thing to think about. I was imagining all kinds of awful things and that was one of the reasons why we said we weren't going to see Finley after the post-mortem was because of the pictures that I had in my head. Um, I actually chose because of the funeral directors taking a photograph of him in his coffin we did choose to see him again um, and I was relieved to see that he hadn't visibly been harmed I couldn't see any signs of the post-mortem at all the thing that changed my mind about the post-mortem was actually a couple of years later going and spending some time with a mortuary assistant um, and she explained to me that when babies come into her care if they're not dressed, she dresses them. If they don't have a blanket or a teddy, she gives them a blanket and a teddy. She talks to them. If there are babies in her care together, they are together in the fridge so that they're not on their own. And those things are really, really important things to tell midwives. I'd, I'd expect, I'd hope that midwives are, to tell parents, sorry, and I'd hope that midwives are willing to go down to the mortuary and follow the baby's journey so that you can tell parents exactly what will happen to their baby. Because actually there were things that were really reassuring to know that anything that is taken from the baby in a post-mortem and tested is actually returned. So they don't keep anything. There's been a lot of scandal in the UK over the years about babies' um, organs being kept with and separated from the babies. And, and that plays on your mind, I think, as a parent. But actually the care that people generally received in, in the mortuary is... is, is of a good standard and parents don't generally know that. 
Um, so I'm just reading more questions. Very frustrating that the ultrasound scan was done rather than just the to the emergency cesarean. How was this explained to you? Um, it wasn't explained at the time. I don't understand the decision make, making process. Um, afterwards, I asked why they did an ultrasound and wanted to do an internal um, at the point where his heartbeat had stopped, had dropped to the point of not being able to be picked up and they couldn't get it back again. Um, and, and it was explained to me that if he had died, I would have had to have had a natural birth, not a cesarean because of the ongoing risks for next pregnancy. Um, and I, that concerns me. The decision making process at that point was not around saving my baby. It was around protecting me for future pregnancies, which I think is why the midwife stepped in to change the doctor's decision. But there, there's a lot that was quite frustrating about the case. Oh, I'm just reading Joe's comment about that you were asked by a couple to attend the baby's post-mortem as their advocate. I think that's a really great thing to be able to offer. And I think, Rona, I, I think a DVD explaining the process is a, is a great idea. Um, I, I think I would recommend that completely. It really did take away a lot of the guilt once I knew that babies are treated with respect and that everything's returned to them um, it felt much much of a more of a kinder thing the post-mortem actually was fairly pointless in that we never really found out a cause for what happened to Finley um, he, ju he just got into distress and his heart stopped and he wasn't saved in time is it important to visit the funeral I think for I think that depends on the parents. For for us, um, it was really important to have the funeral. It was really important to have a private funeral. So we had it at actually just about on our third wedding anniversary. We had it in the same church that we'd got married in with the same vicar. And that continuity for us was really, really important. I've been with other parents um, who have had multiple losses and actually having further funerals is much, much more difficult for them. So sometimes they might choose the hospital process rather than having a funeral. Um, we have special graves for stillborn babies too. Most cemeteries have, um, have spaces where the babies are all kept together. Um, sometimes there are mass graves, which is an important thing to communicate to parents. So hospital services might involve the, the baby's ashes going into a grave with lots of other babies, which parents might need to know. I think it's also important to talk to parents about the fact that there might not be any ashes if they choose a cremation. Sometimes parents choose a cremation because they get to keep part of the baby. But if the baby's very small or in some places, if they can't separate the ashes of the coffin from the ashes of the baby, they don't give parents anything back, which can be really distressing. Okay, thank you very, very much for your answers, Mel. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a, a topic uh, which is often underestimated and there's small room for this difficult topic. And um, I'm very touched by the effort you put in your presentation. Um, very happy you, um, I met you. And thank you again to bring your story to uh, to this place. Um, thank you, Christian, and thank I, you for all the technical help. <laughs> <laughs> I tried hard, so I will stop now. The the, the